Welcome everyone to Talks at Google. My name is Alexandrina, or you can call me AGV. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Two of my big passions, both at work and in my personal life, are sustainability and technology. Um, in partnership, sorry, uh, yes, and so in partnership with Google.org and in the spirit of World Environment Day, I'm really thrilled to be here with uh, Clara Rowe, who sits on the intersection of both of these topics. Clara Rowe has more than a decade of experience in natural resource management, international development, and sustainable agriculture. This expertise is bridging the gap between global sustainability solutions and the on-the-ground challenges, um, which has prepared her for the work that she's doing today as the CEO of Restore, which is a science-based open data platform that supports and connects restoration projects of all sizes around the world. Restore was founded by Crother Lab and is powered by Google Earth Engine and Google Cloud. And Restore has received over $1.2 million from Google.org. Clara was recently recognized as one of the Google.org's uh, leaders to watch in 2022. Before we get started, I do want to remind the audience that we will be getting, uh, we'll be taking questions towards the end of the talk. Uh, as you think of questions throughout this conversation, just please sure to add them in the live chat on the right. And Clara, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thanks so much for having me. It's really great to be here. Would you like to share a bit uh, more about your, maybe pull up your slides uh, whenever you have a chance? Absolutely. I don't even know if I have control over that, but someone does. <laughs> there we go. Beautiful. Thanks so much for the introduction, and I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. I'm looking forward to telling you more about Restore. But first, I'm actually going to take you on a quick tour around the world. We're going to start in Brazil, and NTFP, that's an acronym I'll get to in just a moment. So I want to take you to the edge of the Amazon rainforest in the Brazilian state of Rondonia. Actually, not so long ago, it was the Amazon rainforest. And a few decades ago, land assignments, tax breaks, agricultural incentives, and paved roads rapidly pushed back the forest frontier. Small communities followed suit, carving out patches of forest a few hectares at a time. In 1999, a Brazilian NGO called Rio Terra came to Rondonia to work with local communities to bring trees back into the agricultural landscape. Rosenir is one of those community members. In 2020, she was part of the first reforestation effort of an extractive reserve in Brazil. That's a place where traditional peoples have the concession to live and extract goods from the land. They worked to restore 264 hectares of previously deforested land, planting 360,000 seedlings from 40 different native species, including acai, Brazil nuts, various species for essential oil extraction and precious hardwoods. The species they planted have great economic value and will create income for lots of families in the future. And for now, Rosanir and her community are planning to sell to local markets, but Rio Terra hopes to open up connections to international markets as well in order to secure a premium for non-timber forest products and TFP. When you listen to Rosanir talk about the future, She's palpably excited about the prospect of a return to lush forest and the ability to drink juice from the acai planted. She also knows it's particularly important and challenging to protect this site into the future, given high deforestation rates in the region. Now, let me take you north for a moment to Costa Rica. This is the Gulf of Nicoya on the Pacific coast. Here, Esther leads a group of women who co-manage a local responsible fishing area. In order to protect fish nurseries and stabilize the coastline, Esther's group has been reforesting mangroves along the coast and on the islands in the Gulf. Esther is constantly looking for ways to create new employment opportunities in the area because this decreases pressure from illegal fishing and ensures they can maintain sustainable catch levels in the long term. One of the new opportunities Esther is pursuing is establishing a kayak trail out to the islands in the Gulf, which will be the last link in a trail that runs from the central mountain range of Costa Rica all the way to the coast, 
promoting rural tourism as a strategy for restoration and conservation. By connecting with community groups along the trail, Esther is strengthening her value proposition. And a regional nonprofit gives out seedlings for the restoration efforts. But until the project starts generating income, she does face challenges covering costs for transportation, fencing, labor, and continued care. If we cross the Atlantic Ocean now, we find ourselves in Cape Town in South Africa. Here we are in the Cape Flats at the Princess Flay, a 109 hectare wetland that during the apartheid era was assigned as a space for communities considered non-white under the apartheid regime. The area was neglected by the government and the ecosystem went into serious decline. In 2014, the government tried to sell the site to developers, which catalyzed the local community who organized and stood firm against the urbanization of their land, fought for their right to green open spaces, and won. Denisha is the project manager for this site. She's a plant ecologist by training and works with the schools and the wider community to educate them about the flay and bring them into the space to emotionally connect with it. Eight years later, the flay has been transformed from a sandpit-like landscape to a vibrant ecosystem. A walk through the flay today takes you past these large proteas growing for the first time in 50 years, chameleons making their way up the reeds blowing in the wind, and endemic fenbos and Stranfeld flora standing proud, hosting a variety of the flay's bees, moths, and beetles. It hasn't been an easy process, however. At times, it's been difficult to engage with the city, and it's an area where poverty and violence, relics of decades of apartheid rule, make maintaining community engagement a constant struggle. So finally, I'm gonna take you north, farther north this time, to Adega and Pedro Gao and Portugal. In 2017, Pedro Gao was devastated by forest fires. The fires burned for over eight days, killing 66 people and injuring more than 200. It's always hard to attribute a single cause to a particular blaze but there are often common conditions that drive the most disastrous ones. And those conditions are becoming more common with our warming planet. In Pedro Gao, extensive monoculture plantations of non-native eucalyptus trees turned into a tinderbox after an early summer heat wave and a lightning strike lit the match. After the fire in Pedro Gao, communities mourned and they also asked, what's next? Sofia Carmo on the right here is a forest engineer by training and she took the lead. She was determined to drive a restoration effort that would create a more diverse and resilient landscape, minimizing the chances of another catastrophic fire. She met with landowners to discuss options, hoping to find allies, but she was met mostly with a business as usual attitude. We're planning to plant eucalyptus again. It grows fast. We can sell it easily. So Sophia has spent the last few years fighting a two-pronged battle. First, she's identifying local markets for native cork and oak and other species in order to provide an economically viable alternative to eucalyptus for forest owners. And second, she's working with school and community groups to reforest public spaces with native seedlings and educate the next generation about sustainability. Rosenir and non-timber forest products in Brazil Esther and mangrove restoration and sustainable tourism in Costa Rica, Denisha and urban wetland restoration in South Africa, Sofia and sustainable forest management efforts in Portugal. They seem like separate and unrelated stories, but each one of them is a piece in the puzzle of conserving and restoring Earth's ecosystems. All around the world, projects of all shapes and sizes are working to bring nature back in remote areas and into the daily fabric of our lives. And all around the world, the other nodes in the larger system of restoration and conservation, seed banks with rare or endangered species, innovative finance mechanisms, carbon and biodiversity verification schemes, sustainably minded brands looking for farmers who produce raw materials in ways that replenish the land. They're all experimenting and struggling and adapting and succeeding. And we desperately need each of these projects and many more. Why? Forest restoration alone is, ex is estimated to be able to prevent up to 60% of expected species extinctions. To improve food security, 
for over a billion people and to remove 30% of excess carbon in the atmosphere. And that's just forests. And then there's the peatlands and the wetlands and the grasslands. But in order to unlock the huge potential restoration has for people and nature and climate, it's critical that these projects do not operate in isolation. For one, there's a huge amount for each project to learn from one another. There's a huge amount of collective learning that can happen from analyzing these projects in the aggregate. And there's a huge need to tap into a broader network of funders and technical partners to enable the work long-term. This is why we're building Restore. Here we are, and to date, we've brought together over 120,000 conservation and restoration sites from 110 countries around the world. Each of these projects now has access to scientific insights and monitoring data anywhere on Earth's terrestrial surface. We've carefully curated best available data sets from published literature and made them easy to access and interpret by providing on the fly calculations using Google Earth Engine. And we've created an efficient system for ingesting geospatial layers so we can update data as new science emerges. I'm gonna pull up a site for you in Ethiopia where farmers are working together to bring more trees into the agricultural landscape. I wanna show you a graph here derived from satellite data that shows the rate at which carbon is accumulating in plants. In addition to seeing carbon increase over time, you can also see how this greening landscape is impacting the water cycle through evapotranspiration. You can literally see how more and more water is moving through plants here, providing benefits to people and nature alike. I'm gonna pull up Sofia's sites now in Avega in Portugal. She's registered her work on Restore so that she can share more about the work that she's doing. You can see that she's specified she's looking for financial support for the work. There are links to a donation website and contact information. She shared photos to help bring the project to life online. And now she also has access to ecological and environmental and some socioeconomic data from Restore. Look at how that carbon number we saw before drops in 2017 in response to the fires and then rebounds over the next few years. Or I'll pull up another site for you in India. It's a meditation and learning center that has been planting native trees. It's such a small site that the derived analytics on carbon and water we saw before aren't particularly enlightening, no pun intended here. But the high resolution visual imagery hosted on Restore allows us to see the incredible transformation that has occurred here. I love watching the trees appear starting in 2011. And then over time, you can see it coming back. Sophia, Denisha, Esther, Rosenir, they are now part of this global network of support and learning and impact. We're seeing new projects join every day and new initiatives emerge as Restore and its network enable entrepreneurs to get off the ground. We want to enable the next Esther, lowering the barrier to entry for restoration around the globe by democratizing access to data and to a broader community. The projects on Restore today represent a range of biomes and intervention types and sizes. Restoration is many things, from transforming our agricultural practices to sequester more carbon in soil and in trees, to bringing native shrubs and flowers into our neighborhoods to support pollinators, to simply setting aside degraded land and allowing it to regenerate alone. And yes, planting trees is restoration too. Restoration is many interventions and many ecosystems. There is a huge range in project size on the platform today, but as you can see, the average size is small, less than a hectare. Everyone is welcome and everyone is needed. I'm proud of what we've built at Restore and we're only just beginning. We launched publicly in October of last year and this year we're focused on diversifying our user base in order to continue to expand the value we bring to the entire nature-based solutions space. We're beginning to serve companies looking to monitor their nature-based investments and demonstrate progress to stakeholders. 
We recently announced a new partnership with the government of Costa Rica to monitor their Innovative Payment for Ecosystem Services program, which funds farmers to protect land. And in addition to the monitoring data we already offer on the platform, we're now working to integrate field survey data, data that's collected at restoration and conservation sites into Restore with the philanthropic support of google.org. We're starting in 2022 with the integration and analysis of drone imagery and bioacoustic data. So by the end of this year, sites on Restore will be able to upload drone files and get analyses like tree count and evaluation of diversity based on tree crown delineation or sound files to get summary information on sound complexity and key species present. We'll continue to build out field survey integration over the years to come. So share ideas with us about what we should integrate next. Look out for these updates in September and we'll have a continuous feature release schedule after that. So to end, I'd like to ask you to close your eyes for a moment and I'll do the same and think about a place, some place on earth that is important to you. It might be a place in your neighborhood. It might be a place that your organization or you support philanthropically or through investment. Maybe it's a site that you supported last time you offset a flight you took. But I want you to think about what that place has to teach and where it's struggling. What might you learn? from other places like this. Building a global restoration movement means getting us all on the same map. It means accelerating learning and embracing failures. It means experimentation. It means new levels of transparency and accountability. We need restoration to be faster and more effective and more inclusive and more affordable and we need projects to receive long-term funding for their work. We need ultimately a global restoration movement. So my invitation to you today is join us, join it, join Restore. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clara. That's so beautiful and the platform is beautiful. Let's dive in a little bit more. So. A lot of folks that are watching this talk are both passionate about sustainability and mitigating the effects of climate change and also using technology. And we know there's so many areas to take action on, basically from emissions to waste yeah. management to food security. So we'd love to learn more about your focus. Can you tell us more about the impact of restoration and the importance of supporting these efforts? And also, I know you gave us this beautiful um, interconnected impact story of, of all these beautiful humans working on restoration. But can you also kind of drill down more specifically too on Restore itself and, and how mm -hmm. it, 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 it's having those impacts, if you don't mind? Absolutely. So to your first question, I think what you mentioned about the range of ways to take action is a really important place to start. I think often, and in fact, the nature-based solution space the restoration space has sort of been accused of shadowing out the other important actions that are really needed. Conserving forest, decarbonizing, changing the way that we you know, purchase and consume. And so I think that has to be the first thing that we recognize that all of those things are necessary. But the numbers that I gave in terms of the potential from a biodiversity perspective, a climate perspective, a people perspective, that's really what we're trying to keep in mind when we think about restoration. We know that this can be a key piece in the puzzle in terms of planetary resilience. And that's not just climate. And that's why we highlight benefits like biodiversity, benefits like livelihoods for people. So you know, th those are the headline figures. I think we all are now more aware of things like bi global pandemics and what it is that biodiversity um, means there. I think we're thinking more about coastline protection and thinking more about drought resilience. And so there's many, many facets to that from a restoration perspective. And then in terms of how we're supporting people like Sofia and Esther and Rosenir, those stories that I told, a number of different ways. And actually, depending on on who you are um, and what you're trying to do, what stage of work you are, 
restore is useful in different ways. I think at the most basic level, we're doing two things. We're providing data to projects. So we're useful in the way that we are supplying both ecological contextual data and monitoring data. And then we're useful in that we're providing a place for projects to come together and learn from each other. And I'm happy to drill down into any more of that, but that is kind of big picture. It's restore to the user and it's user to user. Great. And, and just from an educational standpoint, who would you say are the, the users in general? If you can just give me maybe a few profiles. Absolutely. Well, I, th I think that the, the four women that I profiled are good examples and, and the organizations that they are a part of or that they represent are a good example of the kind of range that we see on the platform. We have very, very small users who might be a single agroforestry plot in Honduras, for example. And then we have WWF who's, you know, looking at thousands and thousands of projects across many, many countries around the world. And of course, they're an umbrella organization that is often linking to smaller scale local projects and doing funding. So we really see the whole gamut. And last year, as I hinted at, our really big focus was on practitioners, people doing work on the ground. And those sites that you saw on the Restore platform, those 100 120,000 sites, those are coming from the core user base of people who are doing restoration and conservation actively. And as I mentioned, we're expanding that to different kinds of actors in this sort of restoration value chain or restoration ecosystem, if we want to think about it that way. Funding is a huge need for the projects that we're supporting on Restore. And so we know that having the eyes of corporate funders, government funders, foundation funders is really important to enabling their work. And so we feel like we need to serve a wider user base in order for those users to serve each other in ways that are as impactful as possible. Yeah, I agree. And I think geospatial data in itself is, is a blooming area. I mean, it's, it's kind of like our eyes in an, in an area that we just don't understand how systems are all interconnected. And so I love that you are integrating all these higher level observations and making it accessible to anybody. Um, That's and cool. yep. it, it, kind, it kind of reminds me a little bit of microfinancing, but like mm. on steroids, it's fantastic. Mm. It's very multi, um, has a lot of facets to it. So mm -hmm. I think that it's extremely helpful and extremely timely. Um, may I ask, um, how did you come up with the idea of Restore, if you don't mind sharing with us? I am happy to say that I didn't come up with the idea. <laughs> um, I've been a part of building Restore from very early on, but the idea for Restore came from the Crowther Lab at ETH Zurich and actually came from a number of scientific publications that were working to map the extent of world forests and understand the impact of both current forests and you know, potential forests from restoration on the climate and on a number of different factors. And there was so much interest in that, but also, you know, I think really important discussion that came up around how does this fit into a broader sustainable development agenda and into a broader climate agenda that that inspired this scientific lab to say, we need to get data into the hands of people who can actually do something about it. And we need to do it in a way that's transparent and that is really kind of bringing together, again, not just scientific data, but ultimately local knowledge all around the world and, and bring that into a single place. And so I came on really early. I was, you know, employee number two, just as we were spinning off from the science lab and becoming our own independent organization. So it's been really fun to get to be a part of co-creating what it means to take this idea of getting science into the hands of people who need it, connecting them, bringing transparency to the space, and then really figure out, okay, who are we serving? How do we serve them best? What does this look like moving forward? It's beautiful. Yeah, I, think, I strongly believe this is a data analytics and AI challenge that you are, you know, it's very, very large, and it's amazing how you are approaching it both from a user experience standpoint from a processing all this compute power, um, all this data on, on a lot of compute power, but then also realistically trying to not just have public data, but also allowing for custom private data. And so I think that this is very, very powerful um, so many ways. So I'm really glad that y'all came, came up with it. Um, 
do you mind? Let's just pivot a little bit about your journey, uh, Clara. Um, uh, you grew up in Costa Rica throughout and throughout your career, you've lived in Mexico, Cameroon, and now Switzerland. So how have these experiences shaped your perspective and really impacted your career, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah. You know, so as someone who was born in the U.S. and is from the U.S. originally and has spent a lot of time in other parts of the world, um, I think it gave me a real a appreciation of the role that the U.S. has in other places, the often kind of imposing role that the U.S. has in other places, and gave me a perspective to, to decenter the, the United States and the United States role. And I'm really grateful for that. It, it also meant that I was always an outsider um, in, in some way and figuring out, and I think it's a constant journey of figuring out how to do that in a way that is respectful and authentic um, and, and where you can still find home in many, many different places is you know, the, the thing that I will spend my life doing. Just digging in a little deeper, where did your passion for nature and conservation um, and restoration come from, if you don't mind also sharing? I, I think from a lot of, of the different places that I am from. I, I lived until I was three. I was born in a really rural place in New Hampshire. Um, I was born at home and that's where I lived with, you know, my parents until we moved to Costa Rica. And, you know, that is a place we've always returned to and, and where my parents live now. And that is a deep part of me. And, and Monteverde in Costa Rica is a place that has been for decades, this intersection of, you know, research and development and attempts at sustainable development and conservation and, you know, and, and cultural mixing and, agriculture. And so that also gave me a deep appreciation, not only for, you know, the, the incredible ecosystems that are there, but the many, many different ways those interact with people. Um, you started your career in supply chain management, which by the way, both of my mm -hmm. parents are in, and I, huh. I, I very much respect and love the, the logistical aspect of it. Um, I also feel that we are similar and that we don't have a traditional te tech background, but we're in tech. And <laughs> I first did not get a degree in computer science, but I, I eventually blossomed into uh, computing after college. May I ask, how did you make that transition into tech? Crash course at Restore. <laughs> I, it, it's interesting. I've, I've gotten to meet now a lot of leaders in the sort of climate tech or nature tech space, whatever you would like to call it. And most of the time they come from a tech background and are interested in applying that to the sustainability space. And so I found that it is more rare to come from the sustainability background and apply you know, that through tech. And it's been a huge learning curve for me. I am lucky to work with incredible peers and we have, you know, an incredible support network through collaborators like Google, but I've had to learn a lot as I go. I remember, I think in late 2020, just as I was getting ready to transition to Restore and a friend asked, so I, I was saying that, you know, Google was helping us with some of the early development of the platform. And, and he said, so are they doing your UI UX? And I was like, what's that? <laughs> And he goes, oh, boy, you have a lot to learn. And I will never forget that. I have, I have had a lot to learn. Oh, I feel you. But you know what? It's always <laughs> endless. It, you know, it's the best thing that I've learned to do is I will never know everything. It's just being in a beginner's mind all the time. So yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm very honored that you are just jumping right in and learning everything <laughs> that you can. Um, I think that's the right attitude. At least that's that's the only thing I can do. Um, you were also recently recognized as a Google.org leader to, um, um, and and congratulations on the recognition. Thank we you. also recognize that climate and sustainability tech sector is also still very male led. Um, what's it like yeah. being a woman leader in this space at this time? Yeah, it's 
You know, what's interesting is I think I have unintentionally found my way into several spaces that tend to have more men. So even though actually the broader conservation space is filling up with women um, and there's work to be done in terms of the balance of women leaders within that space. I worked, for example, in you know, sustainable agriculture in Latin America within the conservation space. And that tended to be a space um, with fewer women. And now I'm climate and tech, as you say. And I feel, you know, I feel lucky to get to be a part of pushing forward those spaces, those spaces for more kinds of people. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done there still. And I always am very grateful when I find more people who are pushing into these spaces who have experiences similar or different to my own that help bring just a, you know, a huge range of diversity of perspective to those spaces. Yeah, and if you don't mind me asking just as a follow up on that specifically, what do you think needs to happen to kind of increase that, the gender equality and, and also specifically support women who are working on climate solutions and climate tech? And I'll, I'll add to that question a bit of what I, I, I think is, is helpful too is um, as somebody who is sharing a lot of mental models about what is climate, because that's a lot of stuff, right? A lot of topics, a lot of science, a, you know, a lot of expertise. And I think that a lot of barriers of entry come in just with the, I'm not enough. I don't know enough. I'm not an expert. I can't participate is, is one limiting belief that I've noticed a lot in this yeah. space, as, at least as a woman. Yeah. And then there's the tech part. And so at least me personally, and I think what I'd like to also kind of just piggyback um, in the response is that I think that helping all of us make this as accessible as possible, be able to ask what is UX, uh, you know, with, with joy and not any kind of shame. I think that the more we can raise our hand and say, I'm interested in that, I don't know what that is. And all of us who are in a certain field to just be making this as accessible, use less fancy terms, et cetera. But yeah, yeah. what are your thoughts? It's, it's such a hard and such a good question. I mean, this is, and, it, and it's not just a question about tech, it's the, you know, our broader workspaces is what does it mean to make spaces that are more inclusive across the board and not just between men and women. Um, and, you know, it's a combination of, True. how flexible is work and it's a combination of how do we prioritize you know the the infamous famous work-life balance um how how do we think about you know equal benefits between men and women around parental leave and there's so many different aspects to it as we think about you know workplace inclusion more broadly it's interesting that you bring up the the tech piece specifically one of the things that I think a lot about at Restore and also because of my non-tech background is how we can sort of decenter tech in these conversations. Because I think what we're doing at Restore with technology is an enabler. But the reason I start with stories and stories of other people, um, and yes, they happen to all be stories of women, is because that's the really hard work. <laughs> and that's the work that we want to elevate. And so one of the really important pieces in the broader kind of inclusion narrative is who are we celebrating and why and who are we giving funding to and why it is so much easier to get funding as restore um, than it was in the previous nonprofits that I worked for. And I'm not saying that we don't need funding because we still do, but it is a totally different world. And so one of my really big hopes is that we are able to elevate work that is happening on the ground that struggles much, much more to be able to sustain the work that they're doing. Thank you for that. And you're absolutely right. It's not just women, it's all humans. So thank you for actually um, helping me change that language. Um, last question, and then we can pivot to some audience questions because I'm getting pinged that we have some questions. Um, so climate change no longer feels like a distant uh, threat quite close now. Um, and the scale of the problem can often feel pretty daunting. Um, what motivates you and, and keeps you focused on the solution? A lot of different things. Um, 
The network on Restore, honestly, working in the restoration space is a very hopeful space because you get to see people who are reversing trends of, of degradation all around the world. And I find new projects on Restore every day because the community is growing fast and it's growing organically. And so that is a place that for me gives me hope. Traditionally, or I should say over time, over my life, places outdoors bring me a lot of solace and bring me a lot of hope and really fill me up. And those are places that I always search for um, and, and things that I will always continue to return to. And I think that I also more and more, and, and this year especially, have been trying to kind of sit with some of the loss and pain that we do feel and I do feel associated with climate change and the broader challenges that we're facing. And I think being able to actually sit in with that and feel that is an important part to being able to actually take action in meaningful ways. And so when I, I am trying to open up more space for myself to recognize when there is pain, because there are things that we're going to be losing, just like there are in every aspect of our lives. Um, so all of those things together somehow. Yes, that's absolutely true. And I am blanking out on the beautiful wording of a particular quote, but I, I find that um, the essence of the quote is that uh, for a lot of folks who are in this space trying to uh, remediate as much as possible and as quickly as possible. It's not to focus so much on how daunting it is, but to focus more on that we are stewards of the land and mm. there's no other thing that we can do except try. So I think that um, I'm very grateful yeah. for all of you yeah. who work on this. Um, all right, so uh, I will let the team maybe help us pivot over to audience questions. Bryce is asking about the source of the carbon stock data available on Restore. So we have a few different carbon numbers. The, that NPP graph that I showed is NASA data. We also have soil carbon data on the platform that comes from peer reviewed literature. So anytime you're interested in where a data source comes from on Restore, you can actually, there's a little I tab next to each data layer and we have a description of where it comes from, the source, and a, a big picture description of what it shows and the uncertainty and the limitations. So we're almost exclusively pulling in sci published scientific literature and always showing where that data comes from. That for us is key. There's an incredible amount of new data coming out all the time and we wanna be able to sift through that and then show people where does it come from. So if you have questions about a specific layer, it's on there on Restore. Is Restore helping with agroecological efforts, Francisco? So yes, we, we actually have a good number. I think it's the largest intervention type. We were just looking at an analysis of this. You know, when projects register on the platform, they, they say what kind of intervention they're doing. And so that could be tree planting, that could be natural regeneration, that could be agroforestry, and there's a range of other options. And I think agroforestry is now the largest intervention type on Restore. Often it's not individual farmers who have registered, although sometimes it is. Often it's a farmer cooperative or an NGO group who is sort of an umbrella to those farmers and they're registering on Restore. But Rio Terra, who I highlighted in the Rosanir story, they're doing a lot of different kinds of agroforestry work, which you'll see on the platform. There's a group in Honduras called Sustainable Harvest that's doing a lot of work. I know that there's um, examples across Africa. So it's definitely a restoration intervention that um, is interested in Restore and that we're very interested in supporting. And that process, by the way, that you just went through of mentioning groups and such folks can use restore to find those communities correct so yes which is already mind-boggling because i think a lot of a lot of the work when we're working on climate stuff is you are really good at building your thing but then you need to really partner and scale with other organizations and groups yeah. um, since it's a global problem so i think yeah. that that's so beautiful that you can literally look for people there yep and we're going to get better at what it looks like to find the right people. So, you know, we've learned a lot from 
the user community already around what is and isn't easy to find on Restore and what they would like in terms of the ability to search through the sort of database. So that's something that we're working on. And I mentioned briefly that we're doing a release of a suite of new features in September. And so searchability is one of the things on our list. Wonderful. I think I now see the questions. Is there another question, team? Yes. Farah says, thanks for coming, Clara. What was an obstacle restore encountered in the past and what did the organization learn from it? <laughs> I feel like we have, I feel like we learn 10 things a day and it's actually hard for me to think about <laughs> immediately mm. one thing that we've learned. It, it, it really does feel like, and I think this is startup world in general, that you're, you're constantly learning. Um, let me reflect as other questions come through on, on a specific example I might have that helps really like crystallize that for you. Fair enough. So Francisco asks, is Restore helping with any agro, I don't know if this might be repeat, but let's see, any agroecological efforts? Most of the world's food comes from small farms ran mostly by women. So I'm curious as to how Restore empowers these groups. Uh, it looks like it might be a repeat, but is there anything else you wanted to add to that? Maybe, Clara, if not, then we can move on. I, I think that I've covered most of it. I will say that a particular challenge for the agroecology context is the scale. So one of the things I didn't dive into in detail when I was doing the restore demo is the sort of temporal and spatial resolution of the monitoring data sets that we have, although I hinted at it. But the data sets that I showed on net primary productivity and evapotranspiration, those are really coarse data sets. They're most useful for looking at big picture change. We also have a vegetation index, which can be implemented at 30 or 10 meter resolution. So that helps with smaller projects. The visual imagery is most useful for those small scale projects but we wanna make sure that we continue to derive analytics with higher resolution imagery that are useful for that context. So one other thing to tack on there. And talk about accessibility. These are all wonderful terms. If y'all are new to remote sensing uh, terminology, um, really strongly recommend uh, checking it out, but this is all very powerful stuff. Uh, I uh, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of challenges we faced and just thinking very specifically about the UI UX part. And I'll say it out loud, user interface and user experience, because now we're throwing around the jargon without talking about it. But basically, that means what is the experience for the user as they go through the, the, the process of being on the platform and how intuitive is that for them? So we... We have public sites on Restore and private sites on Restore. And that's something that's completely up to the user, whether they want to use the data for their own purposes or they're also willing to share that data publicly. And sometimes it's, you know, there's confidentiality concerns. We see a lot of concerns around indigenous land rights and land tenure. And so it's completely fine for projects to stay private on the platform. But one of the things that we learned over the summer last year, so sort of between our private beta launch and our public launch, when we were trying to help projects go public, we wanted as many public sites as possible, is that projects didn't actually know that they were private. They'd gone through the onboarding process and they just hadn't noticed that tick box. And then they had all these sites and they didn't understand why we kept asking them to make their sites public. And so there's been lots and lots of different sort of user experience, things like that. And there's a whole upgrade in the onboarding process that will happen for users was when they're getting new sites on the platform. But that was one where it was just like, oh, okay, we need to shift this around. And that what that means and this is one of the key parts about how we build and how any good tech company builds is you listen to your users and you try to figure out what's happening, what's working, what's not working, how do we change this? Yeah, one of my one of my favorite uh, quotes in, uh, well, not just like focus areas in, in developer relations here, at Google Cloud is empathy and active listening. So mm -hmm. I think those are absolutely crucial for building any kind of tech. It's not just being super smart building mm -hmm. it. Um, yay for UX people. Um, and I just wanted to really quickly ask you maybe two quick follow-ups. Um, yeah. One is how can 
someone get involved and support these projects, just to be crystal clear, Clara. Yeah. So many of the projects on Restore have shared information directly in their site profiles about what they need and how you can contribute. And I know that's a little bit of a manual process right now. It means searching through, it means looking at projects that are interesting to you, and then doing the work to follow up. That's one of the things that we'll work on in the future is to make that an earlier and easier process. But it can be fun. So I encourage you to do that and to go through and maybe it's someplace that's important to you or an area that you visited before. I think that we'll be sharing um, and we can either do this, you know, directly to the Google crew or through comments when the YouTube video is published, links to the organizations that each of the women that I discussed are a part of, so that if people are interested in those specific works that they can support as well. Um, and people are welcome to support Restore directly. You can get in contact if that's something that you're interested to do. We have a community inbox, um, community at restore.eco, but I would say first and foremost, support the network. That's the most, um, that for us is the most impactful thing you can do right now. Yes, and that also applies for um, employee employee donation matching as well. Yes. So if, if you are a Googler, check that out as well, or anyone outside. Yes, I think we should Google. be set up in right. your system. So Great, wonderful. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up soon. I just want to leave on two maybe cool high note questions, if you don't mind, Clara. Um, one is, any piece of advice you would like to share with folks um, who are also on this journey to building climate solutions? Get in touch so we can talk about it <laughs> <laughs> and share experiences. Um, trust yourself and be patient with yourself. And it's hard. It's hard. And it's also completely worth it. And it's rewarding. And none of us individually will ever be enough and we will mm. always be enough. <laughs> and so mm. I think when, when, when you talked about that, Ale, that really resonated that we, we struggle to feel like we are enough. And I think that's in some ways the struggle of a lifetime, <laughs> but we, we come together to do what we can. And you can do so much more when you have this huge community that you're building together. Yeah, and I, I asked myself that question too as well. And thanks for letting me put you on the spot. Is just, um, I think I think it's very important to be aware that we're not alone. And at least as I'm working on a lot of these climate solutions, people have beautiful gifts in so many different areas. So mm. really just putting it out there of like, I need help with this, which is kind of what Restore in a way is as well, is you putting it out there and getting people who are like-minded and interested um, to help and so I think it's very important to kind of just be aware of like, where can I find the help? I think it's mm -hmm. very important. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, just to leave again on a happy note, what brings you joy, Clara? What brings me joy? So many things bring me joy. Laughing. <laughs> um, sometimes I'll go through a week and I'll realize that I haven't laughed. And mm. I, you know, sometimes a podcast will get me or a conversation or a game. That brings me a lot of joy. Um, being outside, being in nature, standing at the top of a mountain, putting my face underwater, looking at a coral reef brings me a lot of joy. Mm, that was beautiful. All right. So thank you, Clara. It's time to wrap up to our audience. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions and your donations. Um, Clara, it's been an absolute honor to have this conversation with you today. Same. Your work is truly inspirational and impactful. I'm glad Google.org. Uh, is partnering with you and thank you very much uh, and all the best to you and Restore and thank, thank you, you community. Ciao. Thanks so much for the support. Take care.